We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So I am, I'm going to very specifically talk about modeling uh, human evolution uh, remarkably in a dish. And uh, this involves this technology I talked to you about called induced pluripotent cells, which I'll go into in, in some depth. Now, studying evolution in a dish uh, has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the comparison between humans, what we're really comparing are these particular cell types and not, not the uh, full organisms. But the hope is that, or, or the belief is, that much of the critical changes that have occurred occur in the brain. And that uh, this transition point from early brain cells to mature brain cells uh, is that period of maturation within a cell lineage wherein much of the magic happens that will be seen as the known or unknown differences between humans and our closest relatives. And you'll, as you'll hear, uh, some common themes emerging from these speakers that these early, very early events, there's, there's real differences that are occurring in the human species relative to our uh, common relatives. Now, the advantage of this approach is that uh, we can obtain uh, somatic cells or skin biopsies, uh, and, and now this technology can be done with uh, pretty much any somatic cell, but you can, you can obtain them from uh, many species in very non-intervention ma uh, manner. And I'll, uh, we've been developing basically a cellular zoo now for the last uh, eight or 10 years where we collect biopsies from species, uh, a variety of different species, and I'll be talking to you about these uh, these species from human, bonobo, chimp, gorilla, and rhesus. And uh, in particular, you should remember that the chimps and bonobos share a significant amount of their genome, uh, and yet the brain size difference between our brains and our closest relatives is really quite striking. We'll hear more about that. And other differences are that in this last period of seven million years when we evolved, uh, many of the genes, many of the diseases that have evolved seem, appear to be unique to humans. So uh, along with the acquisition of the unique features that it is to be human, we've also acquired susceptibility to a variety of diseases. And so one of the advantages or one of the goals of understanding these cellular molecular underlying mechanisms that are involved in human species evolution will tell us about uh, the unique features of these diseases. So in this particular case, uh, we've, we've acquired pluripotent stem cells from a variety of, uh, of uh, species. We take the cultures, we grow them uh, in, in dishes, and we treat them exactly the same. And we use a series of uh, chemical modifications and structural modifications to change these fibroblasts into what amounts to an embryonic stem cell. And this is called induced pluripotency. And in the end, we have a series of, 
of clonal populations of cells that can grow uh, indefinitely. And under the right conditions, these cells can be induced to differentiate into neurons of a variety of different types. And it's this ability to be able to look at each of the different stages. So we can look at the early stages of somatic cells as they're growing in a dish as iPS cells or as the intermediates that lead to uh, differentiation of different, uh, different cell types. Now, obviously, there are limitations, and we should be, we are aware of those. Um, we're examining intrinsic differences that can be detected in these individual cells. Uh, there, there must be a genetic or an epigenetic event that, ha that is underlying any phenotype or difference that we can detect. Culture, when I say there are cultural differences, in this case I mean tissue culture, not advanced culture. <laughs> Uh, social experience is something that's very difficult to, we're not going to capture that social uh, acquired knowledge. Dietary uh, kinds of events are, are difficult to completely uh, capture. And of course, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about our attempts to get in vivo context by transplantation. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really questioned whether or not the, the in vitro relevancy of the of phenotypes that we look at, how well do they transfer? That's going to take, that takes additional kinds of experiments. But what it really comes down to is are there differences that are detectable at the cellular level that are relevant to the understanding of human origins? So there are some basic features that we can look at uh, right away. And, and uh, we know that, for example, humans uh, have 46 and chimp have 48 chromosomes, that uh, they, they express certain genes that identify the most primitive state, so we can look for those to make sure that when we do the conversion, they are retained within a certain fate. And uh, we can test whether or not these embryonic stem cells that we get uh, behave equivalently or, or not equivalently. So it's really important right at the very beginning to determine whether or not we're seeing differences or not. So we, we can monitor them with a variety of, uh, of known differences. So here are some uh, simple ways in which we can do this morphologically and genetically, determine uh, by karyotyping the uh, chromosomes that are inherent and whether or not there's any gross differences between them whether or not the cells grow at the same rate, whether or not they express the same genes. And in our first attempts at this now, uh, years ago, uh, we first started by looking at these immature cells, these, these IPS, what they're called induced pluripotent cells, to see if we could determine any differences between them. And we did this by extracting uh, DNA, and we looked for the expression of all the genes that were expressed in these uh, cells between all the species to see whether or not we could find any fundamental differences that, would, that were, would, were apparent at that early stage. And I won't go through this in any, in any depth, but we, back uh, several years ago now, we reported that there were features uh, particularly interesting to, interest to our lab that there are genetic elements in the brain that have this capacity for, for hopping around or jumping from one, lo one location to another. And these genes uh, were, were very differently regulated in chimps and, hu chimps and bonobos relative to humans. To, this, to the extent that humans uh, had, had developed a mechanism by expressing two particular genes that suppress the activity of these line elements. So the amount of new elements or new genetic material that was added into the germline through this particular vehicle was suppressed in humans relative to our closest um, uh, relative species and uh, by virtue of the overexpression of these, uh, these genes. We went on to uh, hypothesize uh, about this and have continued working on these early primitive uh, cells uh, exploring this, this role that these mobile elements play in carving and crafting uh, novel uh, phenotypes within, within not just in the human species, but in other organisms as well. It, it, one interesting point that I like to, to make is that um, these line elements, this increase in insertions of these pieces of DNA throughout the, the genome add to the genetic diversity of the offspring. And we as humans have suppressed this ability to add this uh, added 
element of diversity, which may mean a decrease in behavioral diversity as well, limiting our, 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 culture, uh, limiting our genetic um, diversity. Now this less genetic diversity leads to a dependence now uh, more on cultural change for adaptation to changes in the environment. And we are exploring this as a hypothesis for how humans are quite similar to each other. So what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is in the next few minutes is about more newer work looking at the next phase of differentiation, which are these neural progenitor cells and then subsequently neurons. So we've developed a protocol where we can uh, generate cells into these uh, very homogeneous neural progenitor cells. They express uh, very uh, unique and features that we can compare across species. And there are methodologies now that allow us to uh, use unbiased methods to measure all the genetic expression that's unique to these, these cells and compare them with one another. When we do this across uh, all the species that we've looked at from chimps, bonobos, gorillas, and rhesus versus humans, we see 2,000 genes that are differentially expressed at a very, very high level. And among them, when we look at clusters of genes that have categories in common called gene ontology, we find that about a quarter of those are genes that are involved in how cells migrate uh, within a tissue situation. So migration, the movement of, of neurons is, seems to be uh, a feature that stands out. So we set up an assay system to measure whether or not we could detect that genetic difference in a, a functional difference. This is an assay where the cells are plated on a culture dish and then we make a, a cut here and then we ask how quickly they can migrate into their situation and we can monitor the cells as they grow into this and we can color them and, and do this in a much more high, high resolution where we can track each cell and look at the direction that it goes. When we do this across multiple species, we find that humans are much slower in their migratory pathway. So by 12, 24 hours, this pathway is fully uh, aggregated together within, with, within migration. Just as another example, uh, we can look at this in another way, looking at migration again as a feature of these uh, cells, we can label the chimp cells in green, uh, sorry, in red, and the human cells in green, and then mix them together and put them at the bottom of a, of a, uh, a dish that has micro grooves where we can monitor and, and, and has a gradient where we can monitor the rate at which the cells grow. And this allows us to actually race our two cells against each other and see who can get there faster. And I can, uh, we can track again, so it's another method of this uh, thing. So here we have, and so it sort of depends on when the cells get into the groove, as to, and then you can start monitoring how quickly they move. So here's a, the green cells of the human moving along the groove. These are the grooves that they're in here. We're watching this cell move along. Finally, we get a, a chimp cell in there, and the chimp cell sort of takes off and, and moves. Again, evidence, another way in which we can begin to monitor these differences. And when we do thousands of these movies, we see that both chimp and bonobo are really quite similar in their rate and direction of trajectory uh, as compared to the human, which appears to be much lower. In a final assay here, we did uh, a floating assay of cells that migrate out from the central core. And we can measure the core of the cells and the distance that they migrate. And without much uh, effort, you can see that the human cells while plated at the same density, migrate out over a period of time at a much slower rate relative to the other cells. Now as a final assay for this migration assay, we uh, took advantage of the fact that we had colored cells and we transplanted them into a, a mouse that had a deleted immune system. So it didn't recognize the species difference between humans and chimps versus itself. So we could and transplant these cells directly into the brain in various regions and monitor the rate at which they were uh, migrating. And I, I should say, those of people who work in this field know that human cells, when implanted, uh, tend to aggregate uh, very closely. So we weren't really anticipating a difference, but it's really quite striking when we examine these cells uh, months after the transplantation, we see that there is uh, or in, in, but we, it was noticed even as soon as uh, several weeks afterwards that the human cells here 
aggregated around the site of the injection, whereas the chimp cells migrated at a much uh, greater rate, and we could replicate this, or we could quantify this uh, very dramatically. So we know now that human, uh, we, we, with all these assays put together, we can convince ourselves that there really is this intrinsic migration difference, which is reflected in the gene differences that we can see between them. Now, now that we can transplant these cells, we can watch their, my, their maturation into cells and the, the sort of morphological changes that happens to a neuron as it matures is something that's really well documented. Um, and with a wonderful collaboration with uh, uh, Katrina Simifrandi, we were able to, to and, and Bianca, her student, we were able to monitor these changes in vivo between chimp and, and human. And the advantage is that we're mixing the cells together and injecting them in the exact site and can monitor them as they migrate away and then look at them over a period of, uh, in this case, something like 19 or 19 weeks, and we're looking at a variety of morphological features. And strikingly, what we can do is we can, we can map each individual cell in the brain and look how, it's, uh, how it morphologically develops so we can see them over extended periods of time. And they're color-coded for us in the brain so we can see what they, how they change. Here you can see, if we look at dendritic length, they're pretty much the same, uh, matching the same at these early stages. And then humans dramatically take off around six to eight weeks. And another time if we look at segments, that's the number of branches they have also separates at that period. And then finally we have uh, the, the number of spines. So these are the features on each one of the dendrites where connections are, are coming into the cells. So we see an accelerated differentiation of the neuroprogenitor cells over time. So as a final piece, what we did is, is, is there a functional consequence? So we can measure actually the electrical activity, whether or not they fire action potentials in individual cells. And in these new devices called a multi-electrode array, we can plate the cells and then bring them back to the array and monitor their activity, how they communicate with each other over a period of time. So they're resting on the top of these electrodes and we can measure their activity. Uh, the system actually allows us to monitor a variety of features. We can measure not just the single spikes, but we can measure issues like uh, bursting, whether or not they fire in bursts, or they, uh, whether or not mo all many cells that are connected with each other fire at the, at the same time. So finally, in this last piece of uh, information, I'll give you this uh, final data. The way you read this, here at two weeks, each one of these is a channel on which cells exist. So here's a, the human cell. We have a few of them, few cells in there that are active, but clearly at two weeks, the chimp and the bonobo are both, many, many more cells are active. And not only that, but you're seeing some synchrony, meaning that cells are actually connected to each other. And, but by eight weeks, six weeks, here you have the humans now bursting and synchronized activity at a much higher rate than the, uh, than the chimps, evidencing once again that there's this early event where the chimps are, and the bonobos seem to be maturing at an accelerated rate relative to the humans. We see this reflected not just in the physiology here, the chimps ex extending quickly and then being bypassed there. And again, we have this window of time. And the way we're beginning to think about this, and, and I think it's consistent with many, many others, is that in human evolution, there's a, a developmental uh, delay, retardation is not a really good word, and or uh, what has been termed as neoteny. And in this case, it doesn't fit exactly because we're not looking at the end point, but it is a, a developmental uh, uh, delay in humans in their maturation that's been proposed as a possible mechanism that contributes to the rise of many human species specific, including the increase in brain size and the emergence of human specific cognitive traits. So uh, we and others are interested in this, this delay feature and how this delay feature may, may result in these, uh, these morphological and genetic features that we see. And, and we'll be talking more about the mechanisms that may control this sort of delayed event, which is so important for, the human, ev for human evolution. So conclusion. I, I hope I've tried to convince you that the iPS cell approach is uh, we're able to generate similar type cells in humans and in non-human primates. And, and there's a, a significant amount of similarity that, that underlies their maturation. But we also uh, discover 
unique features that are, now this is important, cell intri intrinsic, the cell autonomous that we can detect in vitro. And this consistent feature uh, reflects this in the, in the migration of the cells, in the maturation of the dendrites, as well as its electrophysiological activity. So we think that uh, these, these approaches can be used as a model to study the dynamic developmental comparative differences between humans and primates and non-human primates and the differences that this has on, on an evolutionary perspective. So as usual, we have uh, many people to thank. Uh, a lot of the sort of leader of this project who's unfortunately was not able to attend is uh, Carol Marchetto a variety of people in my own lab that have uh, more recently played a role in various aspects of, of the analysis, but uh, uh, Katrina Simifarindi and Branca have been uh, key players in this uh, morphological analysis that they, they are experts at. I have a variety of people in our local CARTA group that are important, and uh, my close colleague, uh, Alison Motri, who's been with us on the beginnings, right from the beginnings on, the, on this work. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention.